camps class on writing horror fiction let's get started so we are in a stage channel on discord which means that the best way for you to participate is to either raise a hand or to um, use the text chat which you can find by mousing over the classroom channel and clicking the small white word bubble that says open chat if you're invited to speak you'll need to click that accept invite button to speak and if you're watching on one of our other sites like on youtube or on facebook or twitch then you should come join us on Discord, which you can find the link to do that at scriptcamp.net. WordCamp is part of this larger group called SkillCamp, which includes other servers like uh, ScriptCamp, which is focused on screenwriting for TV and features. WordCamp is our novel writing focused server. So for people who are interested in prose, novels, novelettes, novellas, things like that. We have other servers like ToonCamp and CodeCamp for animation and coding and other ones too. And we're adding new stuff all the time. We have plenty of free classes, table reads, script swaps, writers groups, with some classes for our supporting members. And that's gonna be things like our boot camps and labs, which will take you all the way from idea to finished draft of a script in just eight weeks for a feature, six weeks for a TV pilot, and just 90 days for a novel. So if you are interested in learning any of these other skills, then make sure to come by our other Discord servers that you can see in the skill camp group here. Um, I am mostly a screenwriter. I have not had any novels published and I have not had a literary agent for novel work. I've had two different managers for screenwriting, but we're mostly talking novels today. So I should just start by saying I'm not a published novelist, but I have written five novels total. And over the past two years or so have gotten more serious about it. I have started querying novels to literary managers and just trying to um, really force myself to learn the absolute basics of how this works from the ground up. Everything I think I know about novels, and I need to make sure that I actually know these things. And because um, you know, we it's diff it's so different from screenwriting in that many of us grow up reading books, and so we have sort of internalized a lot of parts of this writing much more than we do with scripts because we don't really grow. Nobody really grows up reading scripts um, for the most part. So it is, there's a lot that I had to kind of just re-examine and ask: um, How does this actually work? What is a paragraph actually doing? What is the structure of an average-sized book? What does it look like? How, do, how is that functioning? How is that fitting together? So um, while I hope to become a published novelist within the, the next year or two, we would hope, um, they, the, the basics of this are things that I have just kind of really focused on learning, taking as many classes and courses as I can over these past couple of years. Um, my sort of uh, other world, the other job that I do is I'm a screenwriter who has been um, repped since 2017 um, when I placed in the top 10 of the nickel um, or sorry, top 10 of the launch pad and quarterfinal and semifinal of Nickel Fellowship. Um, and since then had a few scripts set up in Hollywood. There's a writer's strike going on right now, obviously. So maybe it's a better time than ever to learn how to write books. Okay, so um, here's a bunch of the stuff coming up. We have Sunday, two different classes, 10 a.m. to noon, we'll have world building and science fiction. And then 5 p.m. creating magical creatures and beasts. So for all you fantasy novelists out there and dungeon masters and fans of role-playing games and video games, I'm sure you'll have lots of ideas for best ways to combine these different elements of how different creatures work and incorporate different aspects of folklore, mythology, and sort of new emergent designs of creatures and things that we're seeing only in the, the modern age, this kind of modern folklore of internet lore and things like this. So we'll talk about just creating these fa fantastical creatures, different categories of them, how to design them. Um, you can see a bunch of other classes announced on this page too. Um, for instance, we're, we have those classes which are kicking off the boot camps, the new feature boot camps starting with a week, the eight week overview, Friday, June 30th at 6 p.m. That's going to be running Fridays 6 to 8. Um, then we have new pilot class that's for the pilot course that runs six weeks. That's going to be Sundays 10 to noon starting July 9th. And last, we have that novel boot camp, which starts on J July 22nd. That's going to be running Saturdays 12 to 2. So plenty of stuff to do, plenty of classes. It's almost overwhelming. If you you can't you can't really do everything, um, but there is enough that you can find something to do on a script camp or a a skill camp server pretty much every day um, if you are around to do so. And we are uh, more than just classes and events. This is a whole community that is intended to kind of um, uh, com you commiserate on the you know the difficulties of the, of the part of your book that you're on. You can share your successes, or maybe you can share, you know, your the news about your queries and how well you're doing with all your in all your progress. You just keep each other updated and hype each other up, and um, just it's it's nice to have a community that is centered around doing the thing that we're all trying to do, because it's so hard to find people in the real world who 
give a single crap about this or care about what we're talking about at all. So if you can find a bunch of people that this is all we want to do and focus on and talk about, then, well, it's good to have those around. All right, so um, we have a question in the chat. Chicago Manual or Oxford? I don't know if I even know the answer. <laughs> Chicago Manual or Oxford? I don't know that I subscribe to one single style guide. Personally, maybe you guys have your style guides that you stick to. Um, yeah, I guess I've sort of built up my own mental style guide over just many years of reading and writing. Um, let's look at the overview of today's class, which is on writing horror novels. So this is not horror movies, though I am primarily a horror screenwriter. This is most of what I do. And also I do rewrites mostly on horror thriller films for smaller production companies and writer directors who just kind of contact me and I do like uh, between three and five drafts on their script. This is for movies in the, you know, one to three million dollar range for the most part. Um, so nothing huge. But in, I've been interested in horror novels since I was a kid, considering I was always the one in the corner with the Goosebumps books of the library. Um, and uh, that's kind of how I got really got into reading was through Goosebumps and short, scary stories like the Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark series by I think the author is Alvin Schwartz, is, unless that's the artist. Um, I could have that wrong. But yeah, short, short story, short, scary story anthologies were just a really easy, quick kind of, um, it's like a little snack. It's like a quick read, goes by fast, and has a really strong, memorable punch at the end. So I always got really fascinated by these at a very young age, and my parents had a whole shelf full of Stephen King books growing up. So I've always had these around, always been really big on these. And next to fantasy, this is probably my favorite genre of novels. So um, in the overview of the class today, let's, let's take a look right here. We'll start with why horror? Writing scary stuff, what does it actually take to write something scary, and what's different in terms of scariness on the page versus in a movie or visually, some visual medium. Difference between horror, terror, and gross-out, which is kind of how Stephen King breaks down these sort of three main types of scare, those genres of scare, almost. We'll look at The Hook, the classic sort of scary story that if you're like, just think of a campfire scary story, this is the first one that comes to most people. It's just kind of embedded in pop culture, probably due to... Um, I think there was like a uh, a big fascination with serial killers and true crime that sort of may have stemmed from the there was like a, a, a several mem really memorable serial killers in the 60s and 70s, which I think may have led to this story and stories like this just being spread around a lot more. And it's just very easy to relate to this sort of you're being stalked by a random maniac type of story. So this has always been a, ver a very easy staple of the campfire spook. Um, so we will look at the hook and sort of styles of telling scary stories. And then what does suspense look like on the page? We also ha have tips on horror thriller pacing. I have a couple panels or a couple slides talking about cosmic horror and the idea of the incomprehensible or unknowable, including cosmic horror tropes and also subversions of those or ways that we can turn them on their head and look at them from a different angle. We'll have tips on point of view in horror writing. And last, uh, just depending on time, we can just like pitch horror novel ideas and log lines. So if you want to get feedback on a horror log line, then I would just try to have that ready by the time we have like 20, 30 minutes left in class. Because <clears throat> that's usually when I turn it around and say, I, we do, I'd like to do some interactive thing for the last portion. So definitely be workshopping that on your own, just kind of writing out a few versions of that if you'd like to get feedback on something as concise as a log line. You could also just ask for advice on an idea for a horror story or something like that if you are not quite to the point of having a log line ready. Okay, um, so pack, packed full class, chock, chock full class today. Um, plenty to do. Let's um, start with just this question of why do we turn to horror novels? Um, and this is an interactive class and again if you're watching on twitch twitter or something else like that you should come join us on discord so you can participate via either the text chat or also voice but let me just ask this of the room why do we go to horror novels what do horror novels offer us why do we find these entertaining and also if you want to get more specific i would ask why do we prefer these maybe over horror movies sometimes what what can horror novels do that horror movies can't you can feel free to either raise a hand and speak out loud or you can use the text chat by Mousing over the classroom channel and finding that word bubble that says open chat. We have a raised hand from Dan. Go ahead, Dan. The power of your imagination and your ability to catastrophize to make everything even worse than it actually seems. Or that some other, some 
for uh, some uh, suits in Hollywood think they can make you scared of with some dumb jump scare. Sure, okay, so you're saying that the since the audience's imagination kind of fills in the gaps in horror, it makes your own imagination kind of work against you, and you can yeah, scare yourself. Yeah, we usually jump to the worst possible conclusions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. This is a big tool that we have access to in novels is just the audience's imagination we have a bit more because we're a non-visual medium. You are trying to um, allow the reader to create the images themselves. We're not creating the images for them. So that allows it to sort of be more realistic than anything we could see in CGI, like Dan has kind of pointed out here. Thank you for that comment. Other ideas. Why do we turn to horror novels? What can we do in books that we cannot do in movies let's get monica go ahead monica sure i think that there are uh some things that are kind of too horrible to ask actors to act out um or to show on screen there are some things like oh i don't know like incest child molestation like really terrible things that I think putting in a movie would just make a traumatizing movie, but maybe you could make some of this work in a book in a way that you couldn't in a visual medium because you get to draw it all from your imagination and you don't have to make it visual. That's a good point. And um, I think there was a... Uh, we'll have, uh, not just raising his hands here, I'll just bring him up on stage also because he's talked about this book recently called Tender is the Flesh, which seems to me one of those ones that people might even struggle to adapt a little bit because it is one of these things where it's a world that's almost so horrible that it it would it might even seem sort of just like shock value if you saw it in a movie to me is how it, what it sounds like it's a world where like people are farmed as meat right so like every scene is full of people on meat hooks and going into you know processing machines and stuff so Nasha what do you, what do you think of that do you think the fact that it's a book makes it sort of more palatable in a way I think it can be um, a just deeply, deeply disturbing film. I think it's it's possible, but it's just it's so um, wrapped up in in Argentinian culture that it's it's not something that you know. It's just I mean, this is a culture of people who like if you're a vegetarian growing up or living in Argentina, it's you know it just barbecues and eating meat is just such a big part of the you know like everywhere you go it, it, it so it's really interesting and it, it fits a little bit more i think with that setting um the way that it's written is um you know uh i think the tone is sort of like um camus the stranger you know like almost like an existential kind of like you know novel that's you know sort of matter of fact in a way but it's it it i think it it could definitely be adapted um but it would be so disturbing it's like what's the market for this just you know trying to find the you know the most outrageous i'm sure there's a lot of newsworthy aspects of it right but i think like a really good um example that i wanted to bring up is uh, is um just the novel misery versus the film right like this is a these are two I mean, it's a really highly regarded film, great screenplay, great, great, you know, really well executed. And it's, it's a great adaptation of the book. But in the book, you really feel the terror of the protagonist, like, living in this situation with someone with that extreme you know, mental illness where they're kind of like, so, uh, you know, this bipolar disorder where they're like, maybe a good day, a bad day, or, you know, like just can turn into a really like frightening, um, just feeling of, of, and just, if you, if you've known someone that's dealt with those kinds of disorders before, it, it just feels very authentic in a way that, you know, the, the, the film just doesn't quite, can't quite capture. Yeah, that makes like sense. It, it feels terrifying. It, it sounds like the book t can make us feel like we're living in a longer period of time because the movie is just such a condensed sort of story. We just can't feel like, in, in the same way that a book can put you in someone's experience for a longer period. 
Um, or if there are just ways that we can access a character's life over a longer span than most horror narratives on screen will allow us to, I think. Definitely. Yeah. And, and just, I think there's something about the, you know, um, really close POV of a novel that you just, you know, like even in a film, we are kind of getting into the head of the, of the protagonist, but it's, it's just so much deeper that the, the terrifying things feel more, you know, if, it, if they're well done and then that those moments feel a lot more terrifying. For sure. Yeah. If we're in the head of someone who feels like they are becoming terrified or going insane, then it sort of feels like we, the reader are going insane as, as, as it goes on. Things like um, House of Leaves is a, an example of one of those books that just, you feel like you are going crazy as you read it. Um, thank you for these comments, guys. Um, I want to look at just my sort of main three uh, reasons, like rash, I don't know what we call these, re reasons why we might turn to horror novels instead of horror movies, or the advantages that we are afforded in this medium, specifically in comparison to movies. Just, I have to say, as a, just coming at this from the perspective of a horror writer, I have to ask, is this idea better as a book or better as a movie? Um, and in the world of novels, we have no budget limitations which is a really, really big thing, with no restrictions based on time period, language, culture, contained environment, or time passing, where in, in, a, in a movie, those, some of those things might be really difficult to fully convey or to, for the audience to understand. Or in, in some cases, like um, we, we like a more familiar setting, and it, it's easier to present any setting as more familiar, or uh, it's easier to, I guess... Um, immerse the audience in a completely different setting than we live in in reality in a book. And since we have no limitations, like the costumes are never going to look cheap in a book, for instance. The vistas are never not going to look stunning, and the special effects are never going to look bad. We have access to sort of more weird, abstract, and unfilmable ideas, too. I guess we could say that no idea is really unfilmable exactly, but the idea is kind of that... Um, the, the audience for a, a novel will be it's harder to shake them out of the story in the in ways that you can in movies quite easily um or it you're sort of just able to access weirder stuff like the fact that books are so so much a medium of ideas then we can have story like these crazy lovecraftian odysseys um that would just not make sense in a movie or like ultimately would feel sort of meandering or pointless or hallucinatory in a movie uh, we can have much longer stories, too. So look at a, your average Stephen King book, which is um, ostensibly just he, he's writing horror movies in book form, but he can write them at it in, in much longer form, like uh, like It, for instance, which whenever it's adapted has to be split into multiple chapters in order to possibly get through it all. You can write horror on an epic scale in a book. We can also, as people have mentioned, get deeper into the character's psychological experience and mental experience and emotions so we can convey what it's like to we can have years pass in a book and sort of convey people's emotional experience during that time we can also delve deeper into specifically what your character's thinking or why they're doing what they're doing allowing us to do things like build sympathy for that character in a different way if your main character is a serial killer like patrick bateman we can see the way that that book american psycho kind of um makes you on his side is a little like not we're not exactly on his side but we are just very entertained by him, and the way that he, we're entertained by him is very different in the book versus in the movie. The movie being a little bit more comedic and slapsticky, almost like a little bit more like a horror comedy. Whereas I guess the book is also a horror comedy, but one where we have long passages of just the character monologuing about stuff or listing the different brands of he's interested in, or li rattling off long music reviews or things like this. So we can kind of get to know the characters in a very different way in a book versus in a movie with access to their full interiority in a book at all times, um, so there's just more tools that we can access. Okay, let's look at what is scary. We have anticipation and dread, the unknown, shock, and corrupted and broken mundanity, which I have a slide on to kind of explain a little bit more. So I think um, we'll get more into this because we, I don't want to do way too many slides on just the different types of scary stuff. And we have I wanted to mostly focus on King's breakdown of horror, terror, gross out later. So I'll just kind of quickly go through these. But if we're saying anticipation and dread is just waiting for the scary thing to happen, the unknown, or I get, let's say shock next. So we're waiting for the scary thing to happen. Shock is the actual scary thing happening. Somebody jumping out at us. 
the unknown is kind of something that we have a little bit more access to in books because it's sort of the abstract idea of that we are the tiny ant in the universe and we don't know what's out there. We don't know what's in the deep, dark water. It could resolve in a visual way, like in a movie, just looking at a dark doorway waiting for something to come out of it kind of accesses the sphere of the unknown. Whereas in a book, we could describe it more in terms of ideas, right? Like just thinking about an empty house might kind of, if you describe it right in a book, be able to evoke that same fear of the unknown, and like in the opening passages of Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House. And then last, I have the corrupted and broken mundanity, which I want to go to a slide to just explain what I mean here a little more. There's a reason that more horror stories take place in suburban houses and secluded cabins and dingy apartment buildings than they do on alien planets or in the ancient past, which is not to say that there's none of those, and I actually really like when we do have horror in different sort of settings, but most of them aren't, and we should think a little beyond just budget limitations. When we're in the world of books where budget doesn't matter at all, we have to ask the question, what is scary about everyday stuff, mundanity, stuff that we're used to? Horror kind of requires a baseline of normalcy because we can't just have every scene be the scariest scene ever or else we'll just be overwhelmed, and we need these breathing moments or these periods of downtime or ordinary kind of world before we will understand what is being broken, corrupted, or subverted. We need to see the world functioning as intended before you start breaking it. And once you do establish that baseline, it can also be unsettling to see something which is, in fact, supposed to be safe or ordinary become twisted and dangerous, rather than encounter having your characters encounter some completely foreign or alien thing. Though that can at times, you know, also have its place. Shocking stuff just overall loses its effect when we're oversaturated with it in every single scene. So think of like a mirror, for instance. It's a, it's a common household item that's often used for grooming or self-reflection, but in horror stories, mirrors can become a portal to a different dimension, or they might reveal something scary in them, um, some different view, a distorted view of the protagonist. Televisions and video games, we see things, we see these you know, stories like The Ring, which are normally associated with entertainment or relaxation. Everybody's got it in their house. It can become a source of terror when they display disturbing images or messages or they act as kind of portals to the unknown, the beyond. So the reason why corrupted, broken mundanity is so effective in horror writing is because it just sort of taps into some of our primal fears in it. And to some extent, it allows us to access primal fears we didn't even know that we had, or it allows those primal fears to intrude on our everyday lives in such a way that we can imagine that that might happen to us in a way that we might not necessarily feel if it's like someone getting eaten by an alien. Whereas, like, I've never really seen an alien, and I've never really actually been worried about an alien eating me. But I have a TV in my house, and it sure would be creepy if it turned on in the middle of the night and was playing a video of somebody saying my name, right? So we can rely on the familiarity and predictability of our environment and our everyday experience to feel safe and secure. And only when that safety blanket is there can it be torn away in, in the way that horror stories need to. And when that's disrupted, we feel vulnerable and exposed. So by taking something that is normally benign and turning it into a threat... Horror writers can create that sense of unease and tension that's really difficult to shake off. Looks like we have a raised hand. Go ahead. It looks like your mic is on mute. There you go. Yes. I had it on mute. Um, what... I wanted to like ask is there's an example of a books that I read when I kind of found them out because here they were not like available but in comparison to the movie they're way better the scary stories to tell in the dark mm -hmm. they have like images they're not like living it to the imagination they have these pictures drawn and that also kind of helps with the dread, I think. But is it better, like, when the stories have, like, images, like in this case? Or do you think it's better when they're just books told from purely, like, words, and they don't have any depiction of what they're showing, like H.P. Lovecraft, that he leaves most of his monsters to the imagination like in the color that he literally says it's something that it's a color that makes people go mad and he never like describes it 
these right, like right, alien right. beings that we're seeing. Well, okay, so this is a good question. Is horror more effective if we have images to uh, illustrate what we're talking about or if we're just using words? Um, and I would say that they have different advantages. Um, in So I wouldn't say one is better than the other. Like an illustrated book is not automatically better than a book without illustrations um, because if the illustrations don't turn out very good, then ultimately it, it detracts a little bit from what your imagination might have been able to come up with instead. So I would say, yeah, like the scary stories, the original um, uh, scary stories to tell in the dark, which I've linked here by uh, yeah by Alvin Schwartz, illustrated illustrated by Stephen Gamble. Um, the original art was really, really, really creepy and was a big part of why those stories are so memorable. So yeah, in some cases they can enhance the story and they can um, I illustrations or um, y you know images of some kind can. Uh, they can act as sort of a, a bit more, you get a bit more of impact of shock from them. Like it's almost like a jump scare in a way. Like Junji Ito comics, the horror manga writer Junji Ito, his comics have what we might almost consider to be jump scares on the page, where you turn the page and there's something like a zombie or a monster that's right up in the camera. It's um, And it really kind of enhances the scare of that moment. But there are some types of scary things that aren't enhanced, I would say, by visuals. So, like you mentioned Lovecraft, for instance, and in Lovecraft's case, yeah, the monsters and creatures and concepts that he's describing, I think if you illustrate them, it kind of d takes away a little bit from how amazing those things could really look. They're supposed to look so kind of crazy, um, incomprehensible that even drawing it at all kind of makes it seem comprehensible. So to me, I think that, and that this will, we'll talk more about Cosmic Horror later, but I think that, yeah, if you have creatures that are supposed to be so abstract or different looking that we can't even we can barely fathom or understand what it would look like then drawing it actually reduces how scary that thing is sometimes and also i would say that um just if you describe something well uh then the reader is going to be able to conjure their own kind of image for what that thing would look like and it's we can rely on that quite a bit um if somebody's coming to a horror novel they're not going to expect illustrations necessarily um, and it's not usually feasible for books to have illustrations, just because I think it makes the printing cost a lot more. Um, so it's rare for a novel to have that. But then, again, a lot of really successful horror books eventually become movies or are adapted in some form or another at some point anyway. So even if it's not originally printed with illustrations, it's not like there can never ever be a some visualization of that story. I hope I've answered this question kind of. I guess I've kind of said they both have their pros and cons. Neither is better than the other. I, I personally, I, I really like illustrated stories and wish there were more of them. But then again, it, it I think that it sort of forces the writer to work a little harder and to do that heavy lifting of describing things. And sometimes that can be better. Okay, hope that answered that question. Thank you for asking these. Oof, I wore myself out with that. I need to take a break. Okay, um, so, uh, what, where were we? Yeah, what is, what is scary? Anticipation and dread, the unknown, shock, corrupted and broken mundanity. To me, those are essentially the cornerstones of what makes scary stuff, but what people find scary is subjective. Tastes are going to change with culture and with saturation, and more blood and death doesn't necessarily mean scarier, nor does more tension and build up necessarily. So just keep in mind that horror is this very kind of careful balance. I think I was talking Corrupted and Broken Mundanity, and I really like how the Silent Hill series utilizes this, so I wanted to just include this picture here just to show you sort of an example of that broken mundanity idea. So in this sequence in the game uh, PT, which is the Silent Hill playable trailer that they released for the PlayStation 4, or th was it PlayStation 3 even? Um, and it uses, uses this kind of suburban setting but makes it very eerie and unsettling. There's a part where there's like... you instead of stumbling upon a corpse you are listening to a radio as you stumble around hearing about a murder in this house and you hear about the father hanging himself with a garden hose in the garage and you see this sort of fridge that's dripping blood that's hanging from the ceiling in a way that we we've never seen a fridge before um so i just find that to be an example of that kind of mund mundane uh you, you like twist something mundane a little bit and it becomes extra unsettling to me um i think that it works really well in books and as a visual medium, Silent Hill, I think, captures it too. But this is something that we can do very in a different way in, in books as opposed to movies and, and video games and everything else. So we can ask just what is the what are the basics behind writing scary stuff? 
I think a lot of this is going to come down to things like empathy. Like we, unless we have characters that we really uh, can invest in their journeys and we can either root for them or root against them, then we're going to not really be able to invest ourselves in the world. We're not going to be able to care unless there's people experiencing these things in these worlds that we care about. Um, and we can either like or dislike a character because, and as C. Robert Cargo mentions here, the more we dislike a character, it can become more cathartic uh, in terms of the horror that they experience if it's some kind of well-deserved punishment for them. So make sure in your horror it's at least a character we're really rooting for or really rooting against. You can also just get better at everything else. I know this is sort of silly to say how to write horror better. Well, write everything else better. But you, if you write that sort of very strong story, really strong characters that we can invest in, and like if you sort of lull the audience into almost feeling like the story is about something else to begin with, then you can catch them off guard, and then they're almost they almost forget that it's a horror story for a while, which can be used as a really effective rug pull. Um, and I use that all, all the time in my own work. Um, so we sort of make it seem like the catalyst has already happened is a fun trick that I like to use. Uh, what else can we do to enhance scariness? Compelling mysteries. So a lot of horror stories are going to be based on three major sort of genres of what are people doing in this. And they're going to be either stories of survival, mystery. So we're trying to answer some central question or solve some, some uh, enigma that is at the heart of the story. Um, and the last is drama. So drama, uh, mystery, and survival. In, in terms of movies, most of them are going to fall in those cases. And in books, there's way more sort of subgenres and variations of that and many other different types of things you can do. But we can just look at it if we want to know what is the objective of the characters. Oftentimes, there's going to be a mystery at the heart of the story, even if that mystery is simply what is this thing and how do we defeat it? Um, strong pacing and scene work will lead to something being scarier because we, if we start to get bored of the movie in general, we will start to be less scared. And it doesn't always do enough to pull us back into a story just to scare us. Like you have to do, you have to actually have the story be uh, interesting, even if it wasn't scary. And then last, what are uh, things that we can? Sorry, I lost my place. Motivated, fascinating character. Yeah, characters we care about, we that we either like or that we hate, and um, just uh, interesting questions. I think questions are going to be a big part of why people are sort of compelled by scary media it's like we we want to know what's behind the door we don't want to know right away and so uh like the longer you can draw out that answer of what is behind the door then you can if you balance that right and and you use that just long enough you can make us um hooked the entire way through in terms of subject matter um you can start with what things that scare you i mean if you start on this basis of uh, what is just a principle or something that it could might be as simple as a feeling or an emotion or a setting. I, I think like underwater stuff is almost so scary. I can't even write it. I would say uh, underwater, especially deep ocean. We've had some stuff like that in the news recently. Um, but what about like underwater caves? There's almost nothing scarier to me. So like you can start a story on the basis of just, okay, underwater caves. We're going to use that somehow. Um, you don't always have to start with a setting. You can start with an idea. What would it be like to lose a loved one? You know, something like that. That scares you that you can use that as almost the emotional fuel for a story. Something to get the, get the characters motivated and, and um, to move the machinery of the plot in place. So maybe start with this question of what scares you. We can always heighten sensory details in a book much more than you can in visual mediums. Like things like taste, smell, touch memories are much easier to bring in to books rather than doing flashbacks in a movie or or show it's much easier to sort of have your character associate things or, or touch on memories in their past and like you can easily say you know the, the, my father passed me the dish that he got me for my first birthday you can't always do that in a movie but you can just have that little bit of extra insight in a book that allows us to bring out certain details we can slow down the pacing of action in important moments you know, in a in a, a movie's going to advance at one second per second, right? Like 60 seconds per minute, where at 24 frames per, per second, whatever it is, where a book advances at whatever speed you want it to. We're sort of frozen in time until you move us forward, which allows you to sort of always be in this kind of slow motion if you choose to be. Um, is You can describe, for instance, a character throws a knife and we can see the water drops glinting on the edge of the knife as it hurls through the air. And in that way, you can sort of create that sense of cinematic slow motion on the page 
Um, and you can use those details to just emphasize whatever you want. You can teach us about the world building by describing the engravings on a sword as it flies through the air. Things like this. So um, we like to use scares to move the plot forward. Also, don't try, try not to have them just be total digressions. Not shouldn't just feel like filler where we're like, okay, well, nobody's gotten eaten in about five, uh, five chapters, so I might as well have somebody get eaten here. They should always be establishing new obstacles, escalating threats, paying off previous beats, or driving main character to take more decisive action, meaning so accelerating, ticking clocks, essentially. You can use misdirection to sort of make the audience watch something familiar but then subvert their expectations, or you can make sure to direct their attention elsewhere so that by the time there's a betrayal later on think of something like you know, a movie like get out which uses this to great effects the main character's girlfriend who we sort of do a lot of work early on to move suspicion away from her and onto her family it seems like she's just an innocent victim of this like anyone else and then that betrayal hurts all the more because it was right in front of us the whole time so you can really use that idea of shifting suspicion to allow the scary moments to have more pop to them. We can understand reader expectations based on genre and subgenre, meaning that if you're sort of combining horror with some other genre, then we should know what the conventions are of both of those so that you can effectively subvert them. And we can say, you know, we can do stuff like, well, the action hero is just kicked in through the window. It's the climax of the story. And there's no way he's going to lose now. And then you can have that character lose in the most horrifying possible way. And, and the, as fans of the genre, they weren't expecting that. They, they Their expectations were subverted. So um, let's look at the difference between terror, horror, and gross outs. These are the kind of major types of scare, according to Stephen King, in his book called Dance Macabre is where he breaks down these differences. We have a question in the chat. Is this on YouTube? Yes, this is on YouTube and also Twitch, Twitter, Facebook. All right, so um, terror, horror, and gross out. So terror is going to be the dread, the anticipation, the psychological scare that exploits the human mind. So this is that old scary story anecdote. You open the door at night to see who's been scratching at it. There's nobody there, but then we flip on the light and we see the scratches are on the inside of the door. Is there an actual jump scare, danger, or, or, or monster jumping out of a closet there? No, but this is like a dread, the dread of an idea, right? It's more than just a momentary jolt. It's terror... It's turning your mind against itself. It's sort of implanting a terrible and troubling idea and then nudges you towards dwelling on the horrific implications. We don't actually see the monster, but we see the scratches on the inside of the door, meaning the monster must be inside, and it's been inside the whole time. So terror is the lingering fear of a scary concept. The monster you imagine is more frightening than the man in the rubber suit is sort of the basis of this principle. So I should reiterate, this is just Stephen King's definition of these things. Like many people are going to use these words very interchangeably and not everyone's going to have the same definition of these things. But let's move on to horror, which is the jump scare. So we had the buildup, the anticipation and the idea. And now we have a giant spider the size of a bear or the dead waking up and walking around or the lights go out and something grabs your arm. So horror in books can derive from these surprising and blood curdling moments, these images, dialogue and plot developments. Um, it's the boo when we finally do open the door and the monster comes inside. And then last we have the gross out, which I think is pretty self-explanatory, but this is, you know, the severed head, the, the protagonist's parasitic infection, the character getting buried alive in a coffin full of bugs. The scare goes for a gut reaction to just disturbing imagery or cells. In a book, it can be very slow paced and creeping, like a character very gradually turning into a demon. Or it might take place in a split second. Like, I don't know, your character gets uh, chopped into 9,000 pieces in a wood chipper. So that's the, the three basic types of scare. And I think that he sort of looks at it in this almost as a hierarchy with terror on top, with horror below it, and lowest of all, the gag reflex of revulsion. But at the same time uh, that we do land these in this pyramid, we, we kind, kind of try not to prefer one over the other uh, on the grounds that one effect is somehow better than the other. You can kind of mix and match these however you want. And as, as King puts it, the problem with definitions is that they have a way of turning into critical tools in this sort of criticism, which he would call criticism by rote, which seems to be needlessly restricting or dangerous or whatever, where you, you sort of see one of these as superior to the others. It can be a bad thing, he's sort of saying. So feel free to mix and match these in whatever order you want. It's not There's no rule book saying that 
because your horror is too gross out that it can't be literary. There's no uh, there's there's no actual barriers here besides the ones we might imagine. So um, try to make liberal use of all three. What does he say at the end? If I can't terrify him, I'll try to horrify. If I can't horrify, I'll go for the gross out. I'm not proud. So uh, let's do the hook story. So we'll start with this one. I think you guys might know this already. I hope somebody does. This is the kind of story that's rarely even written down, but this is the, as here's his explanation of it. It's simply passed mouth to mouth around Boy Scout or Girl Scout campfires after the sun has gone down and all the marshmallows are being cooked and all this. Um, so this is, I think, uh, sometimes just called the hook or sometimes it's called the hook hand killer or something like that. I want to see, does anybody think that they know this one? Or if they don't know this one, maybe they have a scary story they can rattle off the top of their head without any preparation. Monica. Uh, sure. Um, I, of course, know uh, this good old story of, of the hook hand. I did want to very quickly address just uh, that quote that you gave from Duns Macabre with uh, the, you know, the, the three, uh, terror, horror, gross out. I uh, want to also stress that uh, when he says terror on top, horror below it, lowest of all, the gag reflex, he's talking about where it occurs in the body. He's oh, not talking about a, a tier list. Um, because I think that um, there's there's a belief uh, by a lot of people in the horror community that there's like a hierarchy of uh, uh, of scaring people or a hierarchy of horror that puts the gross out or, you know, something really visceral as being like, you're doing this because you can't do the other things. It's a failure in your skill set. Whereas in the book, Stephen King suggests that these are just three versions of the same idea and that mixing and matching them is uh, key. So, yeah, I just um, I, I think that I, I hear a lot of comments often on the, like elevated horror. There's this psychological level that you must reach in order to be a truly good, good horror writer. And I don't believe it, but I can also tell a, a hook story. Um, right. Very largely, as you would tell it in the book, I suppose, the hook story tends to go like so. Uh, a couple, usually young, quite attracted, we'll call them heterosexual for now, driving down the road in the middle of the night. The GPS does not work. They are lost. The tire goes flat. They get out of the car, wander around for cellular reception, this being a horror story, there is none to be found. And there, the the man will get up, will go into the back, will attempt to find the spare tire, the jack, and do it all himself. He saw his dad change a tire once. He can surely do it, at least to impress his girlfriend. While she sits alone, she screams. He comes running. She says... There's a sound on the front of the windshield, a hook scratching against it. He, of course, says there is no such thing, goes back to the trunk to fix the tire. He goes in, he gets the jack, he gets the tire iron. He manages to jack up the car, but he's not sure which way to screw the wheel back on. He goes back in to ask his girlfriend something. She doesn't respond. He sits in the passenger seat, puts a hand on her leg, and says, Darling. And there, the head turns. It is not her at all, but the man with the hook. She is dead in the back seat, and now the hook is in his mouth and coming out the bottom of his throat. And that's the end of that story. All right. Thank you, Monica. So I like how you modernized this uh, this one and very different ending um, on this too. Normally this is this is this story feels like straight out of the 1950s. That it's like usually it goes there's like lovers who are going out up onto lovers lane or the lovers lookout kind of thing. But in yours it was like a GPS malfunction, which is a very sort of 21st <laughs> century approach to this, um, almost like a scream opening. Um, so nice job. So we sh let's ask the question what kinds of horror is monica utilizing let's feel free to weigh in in the chats and let's go back to our three major types terror horror and gross out what do you guys think we have one comment unexpected jump scare yep there's a jump scare at the end of this one for sure a pretty gnarly one 
What else? Hey Monica, to further update this one, do you think instead of doing the, you know, on the radio, we hear on the radio, there's been a killer I've seen in the area with a hook can. They're like watching TikToks about him or something. Like, what do we, what do we want to do? I mean, you want to have like. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So they, let's they have them just lis listening, <laughs> listening to a true crime pop podcast. True crime pop oh, podcasts are fucking huge yeah, right now. That's way better. So the girls listening yeah. to a true crime podcast that just dropped. Oh, maybe, what if it drops while, while they're at the lover's lookout or whatever? Or there, while the while the car's broken down, a new podcast episode just drops about. Oh the most yeah, yeah, recent, yeah! And she just plays it now. That's like the the twenty first century version of you turn on the the news just at the right time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and the guy's like, "Oh, I'll turn this shit off." You know, these stories are all like exaggerated. It's it's made up. It's just like stuff for chicks. I'm way too cool for this. And then it happens. Yes, that is uh, that is, that's an improvement on the story. This is why we iterate, people. Yeah, we just we're gonna turn this into the Gen Z hook story. Um, it looks like we have a raised hand from Michelle. Go ahead, Michelle. Would you like to comment on Monica's hook story? Also, he had a top knot, and his name was uh, Chad. She says she's trying. They were both influencers. Oh, maybe they're going to, like, the world's most haunted places uh, in order to get clicks for their channel or whatever. Oh, yeah. Maybe... The... Yeah, this is good. The live streaming. Yeah, they, they... Instead of listening to a true crime podcast, they are a true crime podcast, and they're, like, kind of trashy, you know, like, ghost hunter types that usually investigate fake stories, but this one ends up being real. <laughs> you're, you're making this too good. This, the CW is already trying to purchase the rights to this. I unironically think I Know What You Did Last Summer is, like, a good movie. I watched it recently. I gave it, like, a B-plus on my scale, which is quite good. Very few slashers get that. Uh, I was, I was like, very pleasantly surprised. It's a good movie if you guys haven't seen it, and it is absolutely, literally just a hook story. Yeah, no, it, it's turn, yeah, turning the hook story into a slasher. Um, and, oh, actually, though, it does, they, they do hit a guy, which I don't know if that's always part of the— that's part of certain versions of the hook story— is they they think they hit someone on on the way to the lover's point or whatever. Um, so it looks like we have a couple other comments on your storytelling method. Um, Verb tells us gross out with the hook. Yep, uh, Michelle says dread, jump scare, horror, gross out. Yeah, we had some dread at the beginning. Him cranking the tire iron as he as he, uh, the killer slowly approaches. We sort of build up to the scare, and then finally. Usually there's not a gross out jump scare at the end of this. Doesn't this usually just end with a hook in the door when they come back home? I think so. I uh, uh just as a as a philosophical matter of like being a horror writer, I feel like you need to reward uh the reader by, you know, you've put the characters in danger. You've sort of promised them that no one is safe in this story, and I think you have to pay that off somehow. You don't have to kill everyone, but you should kill someone. Oh, I'm with you. Yeah, no, I'm all for it. Michelle, I've invited you to speak if you think you can accept it. Seems like it's not working. Hmm. Well, you can try reconnecting on a different device, or you can weigh in in the text chat if you'd like. OK, let us know if that works for you. So um, we have the full text of, of Stephen King. Yeah, feel free to reconnect, Michelle. We have the full text of Stephen King's version of the hook story here. I'll include it in the slides if you guys want to read it later. Um, but this one's super old. He tells, like, the classic 50s version of it, right? Um, and let's go into, uh, yeah, hanging from the door handle is the razor-sharp hook, whereas Monica's version had a bit more <laughs> payoff. Um, so the version, here's, what he, here's his analysis of it. Why did we tell this? Why are we talking about this? So the story of the hook is a simple, brutal classic of horror. It has no characterization, no theme, and no particular artifice. It does not aspire to symbolic beauty or try to summarize the times or the mind or the human spirit, except for our new version of it, Monica, which I guess is sort of like a Gen Z anthem in a way. Um, so to find these things, we have, we, <laughs> our version is, what's it called? It's Euphoria meets the hook story. <laughs> Uh, okay, so to find these things, we must go to literature. He tells us perhaps to Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find, which is similar to Hook Story and Plot and Construction. But the story of the hook exists for just to be scary. We're sort of cutting out everything that's not just the scariest possible data. 
Well, you could change it around to make anyone the villain. You could make it a creature from outer space, or it could you could like we could start adding more onto this. And what what we were doing is like just a minute ago riffing on what if they were podcaster? What if they were on the? What if they're investigating the hook hand killer? Where we can sort of build on this skeleton to eventually create something full length or something more fleshed out at the very least. Um, but the the sort of elemental just outline of the hook story is so handy for that just like that that reason of it it it's a good thing to study to learn how to get to the point right away and just tell the barest possible version of the facts in order to get to that jump scare in the most like efficient it's like butchering a cut of meat it's like you have to cut away everything that's not just the exactly the parts that you want okay uh that was kind of a morbid appropriately morbid perhaps uh, way of explaining that i hope that all makes sense so far so uh, let's go into i don't want to go way too into suspense because we're all so sick of this hitchcock quote and stuff like this aren't we Where like okay yes that's not as suspenseful if we just show a dinner conversation then a bomb explodes halfway through it's more suspenseful if we at first show the bomb under the table then we hear the quiet ticking as the scene goes on and on we don't know when it's going to blow up but this is essentially the basis of suspense that can work in both movies or books or any of these things suspense is this like emotional process as we're waiting for something to happen and it comes really at this intersection of dread and hope and you're going to get that best suspense that good mainline colombian suspense when you put it at that directly at that counterpoint so or at that axis right so we are dreading that something will happen bad and we're dreading that something bad will happen and we are hoping very much that something good will happen and the more that we have of both of those things the more suspense you will have mathematically you know until you reach some sort of weird point of diminishing returns but in any case look at that that question if your scenes are not coming off as suspenseful enough is there something i'm not hoping will happen enough or is there something i'm not fearing will happen enough so suspense though is that anticipation of the action fueled by that dread and hope Let's look at suspenseful prose and just what makes prose gripping, evocative, and sort of invite the reader to keep going. So I'm going to start out by reading just a, a dressed down, not very good paragraph. And then on the next page, I have the real opening passage from a good horror novel. We can compare them and say, what is the difference? So um, who's, is somebody still on stage? Monica, will you, will you read this paragraph out? This is the, um, the, the version that I've written for the purposes of this exercise, but this is summarizing the opening page of Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill. Jude was an edgy rock star, and he had a fascination with death. He had a whole room full of items which reflected this, including morbid ornaments, creepy scrolls, and desiccated skulls. He had an ancient noose, an occult chessboard, and also a snuff film that was given to him by a sketchy police officer. All right, thank you. So let's ask the question, uh, what do we think? Um, are, are, is this terribly written or unreadable or is it just like not that gripping? What do you think, Monica? I think, so if someone gives me this and says, "What? what's your opinion? How do I make this better? I think, I think what's going on is um, we're uh, if what we're trying to do is communicate that Jude is a person that lives on a surface level, this works very well uh, because it, everything here is completely surface level. We're just looking around Jude's room and we're showing the objects that he has collected over time. Um, but we're not talking about the stories connected with any of the, any of the objects. We're not talking about anything that he's had to do to get any of them, except for the snuff film given to him by a sketchy police officer, which actually I love this chunk of it. And I think that's a, because it's something that says there's a story here that we're going to get. So yeah, I think if you want to turn this into a uh, horror, like we're supposed to be afraid of this character, you need to say, um, you need to bring us into the sensorial experience. Like, why are we afraid of this guy? He's laying alone in a dark, smoke-filled room, um, you know, staring into the empty eyes of a skull. Maybe that's more interesting. Something like that. Um, there's Spec nothing... Like specific be... Specificity and focus, it sounds like, is what you're touch touching on yeah. there, then, right? Like, more, we want to specifically see what you're talking about rather than just listing off stuff. 
Precisely so. And also, there's nothing happening. So yeah. if we're if we're trying to make a thing happen, like uh, we're scared of this or that or the other, um, we're we're not getting anywhere here, right? We're we're just looking at this guy being in a room alone. So I need to know, like, what what's who is this guy and what's he doing and why do I care? Or else I'm closing the book. Yeah, great points. We have uh, some comments in the chat. Verb says not gripping. It sounds more like a character study. Yeah, it's just a kind of a list of facts. Um, let's look at the actual prose on the first page. This is the real thing, opening page by Joe Hill. Do you want to read this one, Monica? Absolutely. Jude had a private collection. He had framed sketches of the seven dwarves on the wall of his studio in between his platinum records. John Wayne Gacy had drawn them while he was in jail and sent them to him. Jude had the skull of a peasant who had been trepanned in the 16th century to let the demons out. He kept a collection of pens jammed into the hole in the center of the cranium. He had a 300-year-old confession signed by a witch. He did spake with the black dog who said he would poison cows, drive horses mad, sicken children for me. I would let him have my soul. And I said, I... And after I did give him suck at my breast, she was burned to death. He had a stiff and worn noose that had been used to hang a man in England at the turn of the 19th century. Alistair Crowley's childhood chessboard and a snuff film. Of all the items in Jude's collection, the last was the thing he felt most uncomfortable about possessing. It had come to him by way of a police officer, a man who had worked in security at some shows in L.A., the cop had said the video was diseased. Oh, eh, what's underneath your name? Oh, if there's one more sentence there. Sorry. Uh, he excuse. had uh, he had said it with enthusiasm. There it is. Yes, you got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, nice reading. Thank you, Monica. Uh, so, what's the difference? The same content, right? All the same stuff was listed. Well, I mean, each item has a story. That's, I think, what I was getting at originally. Is like, why, why, why are you showing us all this stuff? And uh, this gave each item a story. I also liked the white space. I liked that, you know, it, it was divided very clearly, very confidently into logical chunks. That's something that, you know, you do a lot more in screenwriting than in novel writing. But there it is, and it's a really good example. Um, however, I will say. Uh, in your worst version, uh, I did actually like your sentence about uh, he got it from a sketchy police officer because that's more confusing. It's like, whoa, what <laughs> in the world? Whereas this explanation was a little bit like, oh, the film is diseased. Okay, whatever. I don't know. I felt like it was TMI. Like I, like I had, I had something more interesting going on my in my mind with a sketchy police officer. But yeah, that that's what I've got for you. <laughs> okay. Makes sense. Um, it def definitely almost comes off a little glib and comedic in, in the quick version of it, doesn't it? Um, whereas in the with all these details and with all this specificity, we sort of it's a, it feels a little darker, a little slower, a little bit more suspenseful, and you're kind of learning one fact at a time, and each one kind of invites you to learn. Okay, if if he had that bad thing, what other bad thing could he have that's worse than that? I also like the just the details that tell us a lot about the character. For instance, saying how he treats these objects. He keeps a collection of pens jammed in the hole in the center of the skull, for instance. Kind of tells us that he doesn't really even have that much respect or admiration for these different items. He keeps them almost, like, to try to make himself feel something in a way. Or he's, like, looking for some kind of meaning and not finding it. So there's a lot more sort of psychological detail in just the way that the, the author describes this character here. Um, and uh, a bit more, you know, remember how I mentioned we can... We, it's not jarring to go into flashback in a book because we can always just tie memories to things very easily. Like, you can easily just say, oh, this is a given to him by this guy. In this instance, here's a quick anecdote about that. And it doesn't take us out of the flow of the story at all. Uh, okay. So, um, I think that our brains are hardwired to kind of guess what will happen next. And so if you want the reader to be guessing what's going to happen next, we have to constantly be doing things like asking little questions and sort of making it feel like something we're escalating we're building to something right jude had a private collection we start out by mentioning the first thing is something that john wayne gacy gave him 
And then the next thing, it's like, well, something even worse than that, something even worse than that. It's sort of like we kind of want to know um, what is this guy capable of? What is this guy keeping? Um, who is this creepy dude? Um, so this is going to come a lot from our just sort of survival instincts where, you know, we have those who were curious or who worried about noises in the forest at night. Um, they were more likely to survive than those that didn't. So the feeling that your prose is kind of leading to something like we are, there's something scary coming and it's being promised to us. And now we have to kind of agonize as we take step by step by step towards it. That feeling can really lead to that sense of, you know, keeping the audience gripped to their seat. Um, we can use, take, and take strong advantage of things like try-fail cycles and ticking clocks. Ticking clocks are really an effective tool in suspense to keep us invested and interested as a consequence gets closer and closer to happening. Or some, I can think of all the other things that just are adding time pressure to your characters. In horror stories, what are some things that might act as ticking clocks that are adding time pressure to your main character? Some horror stories have super clear ticking clocks. I'm um, living in movie land again, but I want to shout out the cube. Um, it's this, you know, basically a giant rubik's cube that people are inside and the rooms are full of traps and terrible things that will kill you and every x number of minutes the cube rotates so if you want to solve the cube and escape with your life uh you have to do it before the cube rotates because you'll lose all of your solving progress yeah and and essentially also you'll just sort of eventually starve to death in the cube right that too, yes. That's the grand, uh, the the grand ticking clock. That eventually, through enough repetitions, you will either be killed by the traps or you will die of hunger, thirst, madness, etc. Yeah, unless you feast on the other competitors in the cube, at which I don't know if they ever actually try, but I think there is there's quite a lot of conflict between the the cube residents. Um, let's see, we have some suggestions in the chat. Cinnamon says, a tick ticking clock might be more and more people getting killed until we stop the killer. Yeah, that's sort of the simplest ticking clock that there is, and it totally works. It's very visual, very easy to track progress as we just lose characters one by one until only your hero is left. That's like a very, very basic ticking clock. Yep. Um, we have a question from Michelle saying, horror is, I'm, maybe she's working on a horror about a cannibal serial killer. I want to be gross and use dread and suspense, jump scares, horror and terror. But I don't know how to do this and maybe have a ticking clock. Uh, well, I mean, we can give you some suggestions on those things. Uh, we oh, Maybe she's able to speak now. You can raise your hand. Go ahead. Finally, I had to get um, onto my computer. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, I just don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm planning to start mine as a novel. But maybe I'll switch it over to a... Um, to a um a script because i would really like to see it made into a movie but um i'm thinking it's gonna be r if not x rated not because of nudity but just because i want it to be gross i i want it to be um you know i i when i was first thinking of it and i was telling my boyfriend about it and he said a cannibal and i said yeah and i and um he's and i told him i said um I want people who who read or watch this, I I want them to to be so grossed out that they throw up, you know. Wow. And okay. yeah, yeah. Well, it's just you know what I what I want the reader to achieve, not through the whole book, but you know it's supposed to um, get more gross and more gross and you know and and more horrifying as you go on. But in the end, I want the serial killer to escape. Um, I, I know that's not traditional, but I, you know, to me, it's when I love horror movies and I love um, and I love mystery, but I always figure it out very quickly. And um, I I want to show the killer right away and I want the suspense to be finding the killer. OK, because the killer is right there and you don't know that this is the killer until you know people around the killer begin to figure this out and um but in the end i want the killer to get away but um with without proof that this that the killer is the killer but lots of suspicion you know and i i don't know if that would actually work the killer might have to be caught in the end you know 
because um, that's how Western movies always are. Um, I, I will just say, in, in fact, that's not quite the case, that in most horror stories, the villains win um, in, like, almost all of them. Mm. The killer gets away. Like, it, Good. Every, okay. every big franchise, like, in order to have a bunch of sequels, the killer kind of has to get away, right? Well, yeah, for, like, most horror movies, like, if, you know, Jason, Freddy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Michael, yeah. Um, but I'm, while, while I consider this horror, I, I look at it as a, a different kind of horror that the killer is a CSI and it what's what's ironic is that they're also a cannibal and um, and what's suspenseful is that these the 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 people who are who are murdered go missing and um, instead of bought and I was what I'm thinking of instead of bodies being found that's the the um, the it's the police that are having to investigate the um the the missing people and the missing people are um she you know it's a female serial killer and she's got them um you know in her basement and um you know she's you know in the the victims are in different states of being murdered and um so she can basically have a food source and um and she's not she's not a vampire or anything like that she's a human being um but she's just you know she's crazy um so but i also wonder if maybe i should put some of the victims some of their bones you know in places where other csi have to investigate it and it begins to come to her because she she enjoys the thrill of of, of the chase that they're getting close to her but not but they can't get her you know, and they and and it, in some cases they don't know who she is, but they're closing in, and she enjoys that, along with of course the killing and the eating, you know. So. Um, okay, great. Anyway, um, do you have a question about this, or I mean, is there some kind of feedback you're looking for specifically that we can help you with? Well, I just don't know how to do all this. I I don't know how to put in you know jump scares, suspense, drama, dread horror terrifying i don't know how to do this i mean i do know that it needs to escalate you know from you know just maybe mild dread to eventually you know being gross and terrifying um and i just i just don't know how to do that you know okay well i mean today's class is all about how to do that um and it's this I think that yeah the all of our slides are geared towards doing exactly those things so maybe if you have a particular topic in, within that that you'd like to hear about we can go to that slide if you want to or we can recap something that we've talked about today already but yeah this this whole slideshow is all about how to write suspensefully gripping prose like that well okay so um like the the first scene the, the first couple of scenes i had planned were you know she it shows her in her normal life of being a csi and you know um trying to solve uh crimes and then you know she she goes out and she picks up uh she picks up another woman and um you know what she does is um instead of poisoning her she, I'm thinking that she like sticks, you know, sticks a spike like in her, um, in her, in the back of her um, neck, you know, killing her, and um, and then, so you, you know, you find out that she's a, but you don't see what she's doing with the body, um, and then you know, you, there's more um, of her, you know, her line, you that. You know she's a killer and yet she's going about her regular job and a regular life and you know there's um you know she acts like there's nothing wrong with her and um and and then and then eventually i want to i was thinking that there would be a scene where she not where she somehow um you know um you know put something in someone's drink or food that causes them to be unconscious and then the person wakes up and they're you know they're they're um tied up somehow and um you know she's cutting off portions of their flesh you know and um 
you know, the person's like, what's going on? You know, all that, you know, why, why are you doing this? And, you know, and her acting very calm and, you know, and I'm not sure what, what happened there, but you, you begin to wonder, okay, what's going on with this person? And, you know, just, I, and I'm, you know, moving forward from that, I, I don't have any idea. So those okay. are just the, those are just things I came up with, and um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have um, lab later today if you just want some help with, like, plotting or just figuring out what happens in the story, or because it, it sounds like you just might need to figure out what happens before you worry about words on the page. Um, yeah, so okay. I, would, I would suggest, yeah, come, come by lab at 4 o'clock um, Pacific, and I'm, I'd be glad to help you figure out the story if you need more help there. Well, uh, thank you. Um, and, you know, this is a really great class. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks so much for coming by. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, and that's to, to all uh, who are here. We have Writer's Lab on Saturdays from 4 to 6 p.m. That's where members can come with their questions about our topics they'd like to hear more about or up to five pages of anything they're working on for feedback. Where were we? Oh, we were on ticking clocks. Okay, so yes, ticking clocks, things that are putting time pressure on your characters, forcing them to act. I think a lot of the time in curse-based stories, ticking clocks are very clear because the rules of the curse become just a very simple ticking clock that moves the story forward. Things like you have seven days until you die, so you have seven days to break the curse, or the, the monster will come and take your soul in three hours, or you have three tasks to complete, or things like this. In the world of folklore and <coughs> curses... <coughs> And supernatural rules, ticking clocks are often just already built into how these things work. So it just leads to a very nice structure to a story. Let's go into the incomprehensible. So this is, in in order to talk about incomprehensible, we need to talk Lovecraft a little bit. Um, the, he is sort of considered to be the grandfather of this genre, although there have been other writers who have written things that have been Lovecraftian in nature because Lovecraft, as a guy, his work only extends so far and we have sort of extended these ideas beyond his work. Um, so we let's look at what is, what are we actually talking about here? Cosmic horror or sometimes known as eldritch horror. This is sci-fi, fantasy, and horror kind of all blended into one work of literature. And these are going to be stories that mm, revolve around themes of uh, gr entities beyond human comprehension or, th or creatures, magic, or worlds that exist beyond human perception, that beyond our understanding there are vast yawning uh, gulfs of eternity where ancient space monsters live, and there are creatures that live deep below the oceans, and there are any, any number of things that can never be fully understood or, or uh, fully grasped by humankind, and that we are just these tiny ants in a world of terrible monstrosities and magic and um if you even begin to glimpse glimpse at the truth of the universe it can only drive a rational person insane that's kind of the basis of cosmic horror but in depicting incomprehensible and abstract things we need to use the reader's imagination a little bit more um because the fact that they that their imagination is going to be what's creating the images for them and filling in the gaps for them is going to allow those things to look better, to look more realistic, to actually kind of make sense in the reader's head. Whereas if we just describe exactly what the space monster looks like, sometimes we can lose a little bit of that effect and it can start to feel a little false. If we're filtering the experience properly through your character's POV and we're talking about abstract things, sometimes you have to use sort of abstract terms on the page. And through a character's fractured or flawed point of view, he himself may not be able to fully perceive or understand what he is looking at in the first place. So we can try maybe giving a few key details, these sort of messy, blurry, half-glimpsed details, and then let the reader's mind fill in the rest. Books are just much better at this than movies, because in order to do this in a movie, we'd have to almost not show it on camera, at which point the reader or the viewer starts to feel like, well, why don't you just show it? So in a book, it sometimes is better to not see these things. Um, I have an example of the incomprehensible being... Uh, depicted in the cosmic horror story called Nestors by Siobhan Carroll. Monica, you want to read one more? I think this is the last one. Yeah, let's let's do it. <laughs> so, so this story is about a little girl that lives in a farm in the Midwest during the Dust Bowl. 
And I won't spoil everything else that happens in it, but she ends up coming to her barn to find that her father has turned into a monster, basically. Um, so let's read this and consider that the spacing here is actually part of... That's not, I have not added that in. That's part of the original story's text. And um, this is very abstract, fragmented, clipped sentences that most of the time authors are not writing like this. But let's see what the specific effect that it has here. Sally moved forward. She had to get the circle of light closer before the match went out. The soles of her feet crunched onto uneven sand piles, miniature dunes that hissed out of place as she stepped on them. There was something in there, in the in the jumping flame, a line of vine, of leaves reassuringly normal shape. The vines fed into the bulky mass growing out of the wall, a eh? gaping in comprehension of seeds and veins and flesh and interiors that were exteriors yawning backward into the dark consumed the dirt the air the vine the stone the bird the man that that it had her father's face it used that face as a hand reaching for her sensing maybe the kinship between them it reached for her with its fused body that bolt, vegetable, animal, a cufflink from the other agent still on its cuff, and the god that sadly ran. All right, thank you. Actually, actually it's oh god there, sort of like her voice, and it says Sally ran is the last. Oh. Maybe the Discord interface is covering it up a little bit. Um, yeah, your your yeah. name is over the top of the bottom line every time. Yeah, I don't know if how to. If, maybe I'll, I have to just space the text a little closer. Thank you for reading that, by the way. So, um, sure thing. What are we seeing here? Uh, this is this almost becomes poetry, doesn't it, Monica? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's really actually where I got started in writing. My dad was a poet. I was a poet, and yeah, this felt like reading poetry at uh, open mic night. I think, um, I think that's what attracts people to cosmic horror, frankly. Um, and it's it's. I see it often that people are trying to translate this love of the really poetic cosmic horror novel into screenplays, and it, it often doesn't quite translate because it, it's so cerebral. Yeah, exactly. So in, in attempting to depict this in a film, we'd have to go to the creature shop and order a bunch of foam, and we'd have to get a bunch of chicken wire and make the shape of this of a giant flesh beast with the face of this girl's father. Um, and it might look cool if you get it just right and modify it with CGI a little bit and touch it up and all the lighting's good and all that stuff. Or it might look like crap. And if you don't spend enough on it or if something's slightly wrong or if the studio doesn't like how it looks, they might change it or any number of things. But the fact that we can just kind of see these fragments, these details, the character's mind almost stopping processing what she's seeing and kind of not being able to describe it herself or understand what she's looking at allows us to just see a twisted mass of weird flesh and stone and, and wood. And it's got her dad's face on it. And like th that looks different to everyone. And that's kind of what makes it work. All right. Um, any questions or comments on the incomprehensible or the undepictable? We have the comments in the chat. Cosmic Horror gives you the liberty to experiment with prose because they don't look like normal creatures. They normally are amalgamations. Yeah, exactly. It's rarely just like a solid, stable creature with two two arms, two legs, and two eyes. It's like it could be a shifting whirlwind of those different things. We can just use a lot of kind of very abstract and poetic images in describing abstract things. Okay, um, let's do a little bit. I think I've talked enough about Cosmic Horror. I'll leave these slides in here if you just want to read about different sort of tropes and subversions of Cosmic Horror. You can check the slides out later. Let's do a little on pacing and POV, and then we will just open for the last 20 minutes or so to just novel ideas or log lines if you'd like to share them for feedback or just questions. So be working on those now and being ready to paste them into chat if you have a specific log line that you'd like to get that feedback on. Okay, so we'll start with pacing. So thriller pacing. We don't have a term called horror pacing, really, because thriller is sort of the 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 novel version of everything from action movies to um, psychological thrillers to everything like this. So we, this is how we're referring to a style of storytelling in books. 
and in thriller pacing in novels, we consider these to be as relentless as possible. I mean, well, thrillers in, in, in any genre, but um, thrillers in books are going to also have this sense of low downtime, short first acts, relentless pacing, where we're sort of ending with cliffhangers. Almost every little chapter can end with a cliffhanger of some time, though they don't always have to be huge monumental life or death cliffhangers. We need to have something kind of pulling us through the pages, and we can't really solve everything right away. We need to kind of leave some questions unresolved for a while, and as your characters are building towards solving those larger questions, they need to resolve smaller questions to build up to those. And in this pacing, ticking clocks are really going to be key. So when you're using thriller pacing, constant cliffhanger at the end of every chapter, I almost think of how we think of act breaks in movies, is how you should think of the ends of chapters in books as very propulsive and and in thriller in the world of thrillers as like a springboard to the next chapter so you feel like you can't put the book down as opposed to epic stories like epic historical for instance where you actually want to leave in these places where the re reader is intended to be able to take a break we don't really want to have that sense if you're utilizing thriller pacing now your horror book doesn't have to use thriller pacing you can have a very slow paced horror you know we talked about stephen king's epic length horror or you could have historical horror, um, horror coming of age, horror slice of life, any number of things. We don't have to use thriller pacing. But if you're trying to make the book as gripping as possible, it's a tool for you to manufacture that sense of urgency all th and maintain it all as high as possible all throughout. Let's look at point of view. So first person is really good in horror books because it allows us to see your character's thought process and also just physically feel all the sensations that they are feeling. Um, and we had somebody mention in the chat earlier the Telltale Heart by Stephen King, which is a really good, ex not, sorry, not by Stephen King, by Edgar Allan Poe, which is just uh, a story about a kind of deranged killer first person narrator. But this one, he's driven to murder his elderly housemate and we sort of are able to spend the whole story in his head feeling that fear building up very slowly. So it's, it's hard to make this work because it's so internal as a story. And we, unless we are seeing what his rationale is for why he's done this, and we feel his fear of getting caught, um, then the story just doesn't work. So first person is really excellent for hooking our reader at the beginning and keeping them in suspense because we feel like we literally are this character. But it can, in theory, also be too intense for longer, more intricate pieces and might be difficult to execute. If you're trying to conceal something from the readers, because you can't usually say, well, uh, that, well, he just chose not to think about that. Like, if we're in the character's head, we're in the character's head. And you can't always, like, occasionally you can say, oh, that, that's t I can't think about that now. Or that's too painful, that's too difficult to think about at the moment. Occasionally you can pull that off, but you can't do that too much. And usually your first person narrator, unless you're doing it in the style of a confession, for instance, or an epistolary or something like that, where the author, the narrator is actually speaking to someone else within the canon of that world then it can be difficult to conceal information from the reader in a first person story. So you have to choose that character carefully and it can't be somebody that we're gonna hinge key moments in that story on the fact that they don't know things yet. If, or I hope that made sense. Like if, if that character has in access to information that you don't want the audience to have access to, then you need to balance that very carefully in a first person book, I guess is how I mean it. Okay, I'll also think about the implications of first-person past tense POV in horror because that does suggest that they have lived to tell the tale, unless, of course, they're writing letters or they're a ghost and they're telling it and they're dead now, which might just ultimately ruin your dramatic ending. There's been lots of subversions of that over the years, but just keep in mind the audience will first wonder, okay, well, how are they actually telling this if they ended up dying? Am I actually concerned if they lived or not? And therefore, it might help to keep your story in present tense if you're using first-person, but you don't have to. You might also consider third limited uh third person limited is often used in long form horror like stephen king or dean coon's books with ensemble characters or ensemble cast that we jump around between different characters i don't want to go through the whole example here but there's a description of carrie and you can see how she's described from a third person pov here which is nice this narration just paints an intimate picture of the character while still allowing that freedom for commentary in a way that first person just doesn't allow you to do as much usually considered better for longer pieces. Okay, so we have half an hour left. Um, I wanted to use this time to see if anyone had horror novel ideas, log lines or questions that they wanted to ask related to their own projects. Let's leave the floor open. Feel free to either raise a hand or chime in in the chat. Okay, Michelle. Um. Hi. Uh, okay, so even though I haven't um, figured out the plotting, 
of my horror um, idea. Um, I'm thinking that the lot of um, when a CSI becomes a cannibal serial killer, a um, detective and her colleague um, work together to solve the mystery of her murders. Okay, that's a good starting point. I mean, that does sound like the basics of what's happening there. Let me just ask, so who is the point of view character that we'd be following? Are we sort of following the killer as the main character? I was thinking, but I was then also thinking that there's going to be a mixed point of view between the um, between the the other CSI, who's her colleague, and um, and the detective. So, um, so what I'm thinking is that the point of view um, of um, of the serial killer is when you know she's both at doing her job as a CSI and acting like nothing you know is wrong. And then when she's also killing and eating people. And then the other point of view is when the detective is trying to solve the, the, the disappearances. And then when, um, when she starts planting evidence around, um, you know, for the, for her, her colleagues to work on, um, then it will be the colleague's point of view. Um, but, I mean, I don't know how to do a mixed point of view very well, so, um, but that's what I'm thinking right now. Okay, well, so yeah, you'll have to just maybe do some, do some work on that and just figure out exactly how you want to split that up, because you have to consider, if we are splitting between the killer's point of view and the detective's point of view, then we already know all the answers to the questions that the police investigator is looking into, right? So those sequences become harder to make. It becomes harder to make those compelling, in just because we are always one step ahead of them. We have all the info already. So we might ask, who are, who are we really rooting for here? If we're rooting for, and if we're really in trying to invest in the journey of the killer in the first place, then I think you have to find some hook or some reason that they're entertaining to watch. Or like, why would we read a whole story about this person, right? So maybe ask, what about them is entertaining rather than just, well, she's a she's a crime scene investigator that now eats people but why do we like what maybe you have some specific reason why or you have some like is she funny like what what why why exactly are we following this character why why is this the main character i guess is my question well i could also write it all in third person i mean i think i write third person better um but um you know, I my personal feeling is the reason that we're invested in her is the the dichotomy between her being this murderous serial killer and then when she's on the job, she's she acts like this normal human being, and there's little if any, I um you know suspicion that she is this kind of person, and that's the the dichotomy that's interesting i'm thinking kind of like dexter you know um dexter's always afraid of being caught but you know he acts very normal no one suspects that he's a serial killer you know and yet he is and he he kills bad people you know so um but i'm thinking you know like in my idea that that my killer is um you know is not concerned with um you know whether or not this person is a good person or a bad person, but rather, you know, um, can she, you know, is this person like too big, um, to, for her to be able to handle physically? Um, and are they a good, are they, are they a good prospect for food? You know, she doesn't want anybody sick. Um, she doesn't, you know, want anybody that's, um, in, that's in, that's too thin or too or too overweight she wants like the right uh, the right prey and um so we we get to see that she's she's sort of like a lion you know hunting prey and um you know she she thinks to herself no that one's not right that one oh no this person's this person is coughing a lot they they could have you know 
X, no, I could have X, you know, um, disorder or even just the flu. No, this person, this person's too thin, you know, that beet's not going to taste very good, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, so, okay. I mean, you can definitely do that. I will just say there have been a lot of stories about serial killers and cannibals before. So we're just sort of looking for, uh, mm -hmm. like you mentioned Dexter, for instance. He's a serial killer that in the in the chat, mm -hmm. Verb has mentioned, killing bad people is what makes you sympathetic to Dexter. That's sort of why he's the main character, right? It's why we're following and investing in his journey. Right. And if you're going to have this cannibalistic, serial, sadistic serial killer be your main character, we might just ask, why is she interesting? Well, I think she's interesting because she's really smart. Um, that, you know, that's why she's a CSI. She's interesting because, you know, the dichotomy between um, her being a murderous cannibal and acting like a normal person um, when she's at work or around, you know, friends um, or maybe even family. Um, and that the, that the person is going to, to what the person, you know, watching it is experiencing is this um, this conflict of how can this person you know be so terrible and act so normal um, around other people and just do her job as if nothing has happened you know I think that's why she's interesting but and, it, wait, yeah, but she, is, is there an interesting answer to that question of why she's doing this though well I'm thinking that you know she has some sort of psychiatric disorder um, and um you know that that is what causes her to do this um you know maybe she has um multiple personality um you know that's been done a lot though and you know a lot of it's not really very um very accurate um i'm thinking like that movie um split you know um which was a great horror movie it was really great really really terrified me but wasn't really terribly accurate um and um so you know that that could be one reason why she does it um the other is that um i'm thinking of um um that that novel of, um that it takes place on an island and this man is he's wealthy and he's a hunter and he just wants to he just wants to hunt people you know i think it's the island of dr moreau no, and it's the um, most dangerous game is what you're thinking of Oh, the da most dangerous game. And he just wants to hunt people because he's hunted everything else. He wants to hunt people. And I'm thinking there could be some of that, you know, where, you know, she really loves her job. And and inside, she's really a very macabre person, you know. Um, and but and she's interested in her in her in her industry because she's such an internally macabre person and this is you know to her maybe this is experimentation um to find out what it's like to murder people and then to eat them you know okay. so yeah so you don't have to you don't have to know all the answers right now you can just maybe do some more thinking on this but it sounds like you might just need to zero in on a clearer hook for the story I mean, you have the, the basis of we know who the main character is, you know what she's doing and what the threat is that she poses. Mm -hmm. And now you have to find sort of the point of interest. Like, why are we going to lean in and actually watch this now? Is it because of some central relationship? Think of think of maybe is there like is the detective that's investigating her her ex or something like that? Do you see how it, you don't have to do that? But that's just an example mm -hmm. of like a way that you can add a little conflict in there, add a little bit of a uh, a stronger hook to the story beyond just serial killer being chased down by the cops because we've seen that story a lot so i would just try to find that yeah. uniqueness and that specificity and try to try to find that point of interest that makes us lean in and go oh i have to check this one out even though i've seen lots of serial killer movies before yeah yeah okay thank you i appreciate that and you know the whole the you know maybe maybe the detective is her ex is a is a good idea or maybe this is her brother you know yeah, do some do some brainstorming. I'm sure you'll think of some interesting dynamics and different combinations of el story elements there. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thanks, Michelle. All right, looks like we have two more in the chat. Um, so we'll probably spend about 10 minutes on each. We'll start with Monica on Deer Season.
Oh, am I supposed to read it? I will, I will read. Oh, yeah, a collegiate environmentalist. A uh, collegiate environmentalist is roped into a hunting trip with her boyfriend's family. But the deer in this place are intelligent. They are organized and they are tired of our shit. The hunters are systematically eliminated by their prey and our hero must brave the wilderness, fight the deer, or find a way to join them. All right, thanks for that. So is this a book or a movie or what is this? Um, I have no idea. This is a story idea that I had. I keep a, I keep a, you know, sort of a running Rolodex of story ideas. Probably it would be end up being a screenplay. Uh, if I wrote it out, uh, it looks like a screenplay. It feels like a screenplay. But I think it could be a novel. Okay. Um, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of um, Logan Martin's Meat, which was a, a script that we read. Um, God, was that even this year or was that last year at this point? Uh, in that interview. Last year, yeah. Class we did. God, time has just lost all meaning. Okay, um, so a collegiate environmentalist is roped into a hunting trip with her boyfriend's family. But the deer in this place are intelligent, they're organized, and the hunter and they're tired of our shit. The hunters are eliminated by the prey, and our hero must brave the wilderness to fight the deer, or find a way to join them. The or is kind of throwing me off. What do you mean or? Um I think that uh there is an inkling inside of this uh, concept that the deer have human-like intelligence and they have a society and perhaps it could be uh, they could be reasoned with and they could be joined because um, she's you know probably a vegetarian doesn't want to kill them was dragged along against her will that's my thought did you read meat I just want to double check the the I did, yeah I read I re yeah I read meat uh, mm -hmm. I did yeah. And this, it has, I guess it has some similarities to meat in that uh, meat is about, meat is about animals that like literally they, they walk around. And well, no, actually you're right. The deer do, the deer do uh, uh, start to do the hunting in the end. Yeah, this was not really inspired by meat, but definitely meat is like living, living in there because uh, it was a really interesting script. And by the way, if anyone hasn't read it, I'm going to check my files. I'm sure I have it somewhere because meat by Logan Martin is a great script. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not I'm not meaning to say this is so similar you can't do it. I just wanted to check to see if you had because like that that story had some similar elements. Anyway, so um yeah, if we have the environmentalist, I'm guessing you're saying that her boyfriend's family are like red blooded meat eating hunter like um, blue collar uh, or you know like redneck types, and that hunting is part of their lifestyle. And but then I feel like if we take it down that road, we're just recreating meat almost uh, in a way. Um, but in any case, the I guess the uniqueness of this comes in how exactly are the deer killing the people? Are you saying like charging them with their antlers? Uh, I think uh, they are organized is the key to this. My thought uh, is that the is that the deer are uh, like working in groups to surround and attack people like Jurassic Park raptors kind of. <laughs> But if you go inside, aren't you pretty much safe? Huh? I don't know. Uh, they could probably beat down a door. They're they're pretty tough. They're pretty strong, uh, and they might have a moose on the team. That sounds oh that sounds like a cool a cool idea. Maybe yeah. maybe it's not just the maybe it's the, like evil Snow White. We can we can bring in the whole woodland here. Actually, this almost is reminding me of Furry Vengeance with Brendan Fraser a little bit, where it's like oh, I've not seen that movie. <laughs> that's a real title did not just make that up um but it's a com it's like a slapstick comedy where he's like an oil exec or something that's trying to like bulldoze the wilderness or whatever and then as a result all the skunks and possums and stuff they team up to like play a bunch of pranks on him basically um so <laughs> deer season to me does sound a little more like a comedy i guess just right now rather than is this a horror comedy or do you see this as being actually straight horror I have no idea. I mean, this is a question I get asked often because my uh, my premises are often very far out there. I never think of it as being a comedy, but you know, it it is quite funny. The yeah, the the woodland animals just attacking people. But no, I I had envisioned it being like I mean, you know, being held down and gored by a group of deer can be can be pretty horrifying. That's true. I guess if we go the realm of comedy, it sort of opens up the tactics they can use a little bit, though. I mean, like if we're imagining. They can roll a bunch of barrels into the middle of the road to stop the cars first, and then they can do like more organized sort of heist-like tactics or more pranks. You That's know, true, yeah. Like sort of more. I would be curious to see the kind of Rube Goldberg-style traps that animals would set up. 
Yeah, yeah, they could they could do weird things like rig up a beaver dam and then uh, knock it down and it floods a road or whatever. Oh, yeah. Or like dig a bunch of um, pit traps and cover them with leaves and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Moles, you do the, open the up do all the digging. You do open up a lot of uh, design space. I think um, for me, the trajectory I was going, I, I was thinking about taking was uh, this idea of um, the whole hunting party gets eliminated one by one. Uh, the final girl will flee through the wilderness for a certain amount of time and realize that resistance is futile and then like supplicate herself before the deer and go feral and join the animals of the wilderness and that's going to be the end that's that was sort of my idea the end okay so yeah that could also be the midpoint i i, I like it as a midpoint personally where she joins the animals halfway through and then we have to sort of see where we go from there <laughs> but... oh man you don't have to. May oh, well, I mean, yeah, if we do it in two halves. So the first half is this, like, kind of slasher movie with deer. Um, it's, yeah, it's a slasher movie with deer. She joins them at the midpoint. And then uh, there are search parties, uh, state police, etc., coming out to find the people that have vanished in the wilderness. And uh, now she has to choose between uh, the deer that saved her life more or spared her life, really, or the human civilization that is causing damage to her newfound home. And that's maybe that's maybe a more interesting way to take it. Yeah, feels like she'd probably choose the humans. I mean, unless there's... Is there a really compelling reason to choose the deer side, I wonder? Um, maybe if... Well, let's just think of one reason why you might actually choose the deer side, I guess. It could be that in, in a comedy world, maybe the deer could reveal that her boyfriend was a bad dude all along or something. Like, I don't know. It, if it's... If we start with just the most the in your face thing, the deer reveals, oh, he was a serial killer and he was going to kill you. So we actually saved you. Then maybe that could earn a little bit of favor for them. Um, what do you think? In, in a more serious story, I, ca I can't. I, I wonder how why a person would unless it, maybe if it was a really young kid, like uh, if it was. A yeah, kid who spent a few years with the deer. That's true. Like, uh, like this, this happens instead of be like a, a college girl dragged along on this on her boyfriend's hunting trip she's like a squeamish kid dragged along on her parents hunting trip and doesn't want to kill the deer and uh then she is spared because she's a child that's kind of interesting yeah and now well, she's I, I like this yeah this is good and then like by, yeah yeah <laughs> and we do a big time skip so she in a novel you could in a novel you could actually do this like in a, in a movie you might not be able to pull all this off but in a book, yeah, that's true. We could have it so the f first half is it's essentially like a slasher movie. It's all set during this one hunting trip, and I think that would avoid the par the idea of well, the people just go inside, right? Um, so the deer can continue. As, you know, they're trying to get back home, and they if they climb a tree, they'll just maybe they have a bear on their side or something. But in any case, um, we are uh, we or they just ram the tree with their antlers until it falls down. But in any case, so it finishes off the whole hunting trip. They end up adopting her. They ra this is like arcane almost. They raise her, and then maybe she re-enters society, and people are like, wow, it's a miracle that this kid has finally been returned to us after all these years, but secretly she's still working for the animals. <laughs> is yeah. this the story ever? Is this the stupidest thing anyone's ever it, heard? It is. <laughs> but see, this is one of the things that I secretly love about the horror genre, is like... Yeah, you, you can say that this is the most ridiculous nonsense that has ever been uh, conceived by a human being. But at the same time, if you frame it with uh, with a serious voice, like you're taking this seriously and uh, you make it violent and psychological and human and uh, deep, people will accept this crazy premise and you can really tell a unique sort of story that can't exist in any other genre. And like, yeah, it's facially silly. And maybe you can even laugh out loud. It could be a comedy. But it's also uh, all those other things. So yeah, that, that's actually something that this is exposed something that I love about horror in general. Yeah, that's uh, and in terms of novels today, I think we're if we're talking about things that you can do in novels, it's you have a lot more room to blend tone, I think, too. Um, just because a novel is such a longer story and it doesn't have to be just one type of experience the whole time. Um, whereas in a movie, we have less room to play around with tone and a movie is expected to be mostly creating one emotion. 
um not not exclusively there's different notes that you can play but uh, but um i guess a, bu a book you just have a lot of space and uh you can take up a lot of cr chronological time just in terms of the narrative and you can also try out just different stuff you can have a part that's very funny a part that's scary a part that's dramatic you can have different acts or different chapters or different like our minds are more open when you're reading a book i guess i would say well, I think also, you know, it, it, there's something very structural about all of this, right? When you have a 300-page novel, um, the structure is going to look like a heartbeat monitor with these peaks, these peaks, and then they all come back down because you're picking up the book, you're putting it back down. I, you know, I know that there are a lot of – Nacho reads extremely fast. I don't read very fast. It takes me a month to read a novel, right? So I'm picking it up, picking it up and putting it down many times, and I think that uh, that gives you license to do more with those valleys uh, and with those peaks. Um, and yeah, some of those peaks can be humor and some of them can be horror. Whereas, yeah, in a movie, I mean, we draw that little parabola uh, for people on the boot camp all the time. Like, here's the parabola. Draw the parabola. Um, that's, that's just how movies work. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the we can look at a, a book. You can approach almost more like a season of TV, like a bunch of, depending on how episodic your story is, that may apply more or less to your work as a whole. But it's more similar to a season of TV in that um, you can have just more episodes or you can have more like every time the reader puts that book down, it's interrupting that experience, which when you're watching a movie, we have the audience almost completely captive and uh, they can't we want to keep them keep the intensity up and you can keep the te the the that dial at 10 for a little longer. Whereas in a book, yeah, you can do more with the peaks, but you can also do more with the valleys and the times where your characters aren't being scared. We can do a lot more with. We can have a big, a bigger ensemble. You can have a lot of characters in a horror book. You can have it take place in multiple countries, in multiple timelines, in multiple memories, in, in journal entries or epistolary. You can combine epistolary with other forms of storytelling. You can use multimedia. You can use audio recordings or websites that you have to go to. There's all kinds of interesting stuff you can do in once we leave the movie medium that I think reading really good horror fiction in no matter where you find it, whether it's online in short story format, whether it's in a magazine, whatever it is, it just kind of opens up all kinds of possibilities for us. Um, all right. Uh, so I think we had one more idea that was posted in the chat that we wanted to look at. We may not have time to fully answer all the questions about it right now, but I think we had one more from the Chiquita. Okay. From a video game for her brother. Okay. So I'll invite her to the stage. She says, I wanted to do it for a while. It's cosmic horror mixed with SCP, like monsters, and the idea is to mix a visual novel with the kind of survival horror as seen in games like Resident Evil. I wanted to ask how to create monsters for something like that. Oh, well, we're actually doing a class on making monsters and creatures tomorrow, so you should come to that one. But let me look at the logline here, and she can feel free to join us on stage if she can accept that invitation. Or I can just read it out. Is she still in the room? Okay, so I'll read it out just in interest of time, and if Vichikita is able to come on stage, feel free to do so. It says, when a young girl's boyfriend disappears, she will go looking after him. Oh, there, there she is. Do you want to read this for us? So your mic is still on mute, by the way. Okay, I'm going to read it out. Feel free to, if you can fix your mic, you can chime in whenever you want. When a young girl's boyfriend disappears, she will go looking after him only to find a laboratory under his countryside home where diverse interdimensional creatures are caught, but a huge accident frees them, giving her hours to escape. Okay, I kind of, I like this. This does feel a little bit in that vein of Resident Evil, um, the sort of laboratory underneath the mansion where there's a lot of monsters in captivity, kind of like SCP or Cabin in the Woods or things like this. Um, are, oh, your mic looks like it's unmuted. Are you able to speak now? Oh, maybe not. Okay, maybe having some issues with the mic. That's okay. Um, so I guess what I would say here is that it sounds like you have two inciting incidents. Um, one, you have the girl goes looking for her. So the boyfriend disappears. She goes looking for him and then finds this laboratory where these all these monsters are. 
and then you have an accident happening, which sounds like a sort of second inciting incident. So I would prefer and probably think it's a better idea to when the girl gets to the house, something that happens there causes these monsters to get out rather than having another coincidence. Because if we have two major inciting incidents, then it starts, sort of starts to stretch the audience's belief a little bit. So I'd probably say when she gets there, she causes the monsters to get out or because she shows up and does something. It's because of her actions that these monsters get out. Whether or not she's actually responsible for it, it should be a result of what happened before it, not random, not a coincidence. She says, I'm having trouble with my internet. Give me a second. Okay, no problem. We're, we're almost at the end of our time. We do have lab later today at uh, four o'clock. So in two hours, if you come back, then you can feel free to share more or get feedback on up to five pages of any of your ideas and also just ask whatever questions you want or hear about whatever topics you'd like to hear about. So my feedback for right now is just try to avoid having two big coincidences or two big inciting incidents. Have the second thing happening, the monsters getting out of captivity, be a result of your main character showing up. Okay, um, so we are, thank you, Nasha, who just listed the writer's lab in the chat. If anyone's a member, you can come by later today at four o'clock. Okay, so we are in our last couple minutes here. Um, Monica, just you're uh, our other resident horror expert. Anything that we didn't cover today or any last words that you'd want to leave people with or suggestions for horror novels, maybe any, any parting thoughts? Oh, um, really just that I believe that horror is a big, beautiful, wide open landscape that you can really play in uh, to your heart's content. And I think that like, I often do think in the tropes and the forms, I think we all do think in the tropes and the forms. Um, but I think this deer thing that I came up with or that we came up with uh, really kind of goes to show that you can take something that looks like a slasher movie and then you find inside of it an idea that is much more interesting uh, than anything that you could have come up with uh, otherwise. So I just want anyone who's watching or listening um, to remember that horror is a genre that is all about the imagination and to reach deep down inside yourself and find your inner child, because in many ways our fears come from our childhood self. And that's where horror is best is when it's playing in this kind of childhood world that is also gruesome and wicked and looming and if you would like to hear more of me talking about this you can uh, come to script camp i do a horror workshop yeah every tuesday at 6 p.m pst um, and thanks connor for uh, doing this class it's been a lot of fun thanks so much monica and thank you to everybody who came by two classes tomorrow 10 a.m world building science fiction and 5 p.m creating magical creatures and beasts Hope to see you guys there. Have a great rest of your weekend.